Welcome to Speechless. We're live from the SEC studios in White Bear Lake on this uh, snowy Thursday. Uh, we're glad to have you here. You know, beautiful. You know, no matter how bad the traffic was out there today, and it was bad. It was horrific. Uh, at the end of the day, the sun and the fresh white snow out, just just gorgeous out there, and the trees and. Yeah, a lot of shoveling, a lot of stuck cars, a lot of uh, misery. Uh, but in all that, there's just the beauty of the winter scene. And, um, you know, you people in the sunny weather down south, you're missing it. You're missing this gorgeous weather and the beauty of it. I'm sorry, you, you just need to enjoy it when you got it. And, and it's beautiful. But, uh, hey, the show today, man, unbelievable stuff happening in our courts, in our legislature. Um, you know, the people you think you're, are your friends, they aren't. And you really got to watch those who have power. Uh, otherwise, they take it and use it against you, your family, and your children. Um, all for the big dollar. So tonight's show, we're going to, uh, there was a hearing that took place uh, Tuesday afternoon down at the legislature about whether schools should uh, be built on or by former dump sites, especially toxic, toxic waste dump site, and whether parents should know that such a school is built next to a toxic waste site. F a fascinating video. I'm going to show a clip from uh, Denise Dit Dittrich. Uh, who's the uh, lobbyist for the Minnesota School Board Association. And unbelievable. You're just going to hear that your kids are not important. It's the money. Uh, also, coming up February 4th, precinct caucuses, 7 o'clock. Uh, it's important that people go to the precinct caucuses if they want to. What's really important is that you go to your precinct caucus if you share my values and ideals. Those, those are the people that need to go to the precinct caucus because I want my values and ideals to rule the day. So please show up if you have my values and ideals. Well, actually, we're going to go uh, uh, through some of these later on in the show about some precinct caucus resolutions that deal with the judiciary. Um, you really don't have to go to precinct caucus, but if something isn't happening the way you want it to happen and you didn't go to precinct caucus, you, you really, it's kind of like, well, why are you speaking? You had your opportunity and you blew it. You didn't say what you needed to say. You didn't have a chance for your ideology um, to, to get through. Uh, you didn't have your say of what candidates that you, you wanted to have to choose from. If you don't go to your precinct caucus, you have no say in, the, in who people get to choose from for candidates. So that's where everything happens, February 4th. It really decides. It's the groundwork that decides the next two years in the legislature. It has a big, big impact. If you're not there... It, then you miss out. You really don't have a say. You really got no reason to complain. You can. You get to. But, you know, you, you missed your opportunity, and I don't feel sorry for you. And I have people that say they don't go. It doesn't do any good. Well, baloney. You know, it, it does do good. And um, just because you didn't get your way one time, well, maybe you need to reevaluate what you're thinking, what you're doing. Uh, and then if you're not willing to stand up for your own ideology and, and your own wh way you think things should be and how the relationship between things should be defined, what the law is and should be, you know, if it's not worth you to do it, I, you know, I just don't feel sorry for you. And you shouldn't feel sorry for yourself either. Uh, getting up, but if you got, went and got outvoted, you got a right to say some stuff. I mean, you, you know, you got a right to speak out. And, and, of course, you do if you don't. You still have that right. But at least it's a legitimate response. And because you were there, you did, did your job. And um, it has credibility to what you're saying uh, versus those that don't go and try to complain. Now, I don't want to hear it. Okay. Uh, then there was a town hall meeting today, uh, not today, 
last Saturday, I believe, and uh, Chuck Wigger, actually all the legislators that were there uh, were asked questions about the judiciary and gave their response, so we're going to have a clip from that. Oh, I'd say not all of them gave a response. Uh, the question was asked for all of them to answer, but they moved on with just one person answering it. But you want to see what Senator Wigger had to say because I'm going to parse that out for you and to read between the line as to what he didn't say uh, and what he did say with not saying it. All right, reading between the lines. Then, wow, you know, it's been a busy week. You know, you got Saturday, uh, Monday, uh, district court hearing, um, contempt of court charges brought against attorney Michelle McDonald for taking a picture of a camera in a courtroom, also obstruction of justice charges brought against her that were finally dropped. Um, but to hear what these deputies in the courtroom testified to, unbelievable. Uh, and also uh, the judge was subpoenaed to testify in this case and the state attorney general's office came in and tried to squash that subpoena. And that was just a fascinating discussion. Also, we're going to talk about cameras in the courtroom and dealing with this case because you guys should have seen it. If, um, I mean, this was fantastic video, and they would not let me videotape this hearing. And people, it would educate people unbelievably to see what's going on in our courtroom and behind the scenes. And now I just have to tell it to you. That's all I have. And... I'm, that's not my strength. My strength is taking the video, that's my form of media, getting it to you so you can see it, you can make up your own mind, and Judge Metzen wouldn't let me do it. And, you know, the total violation of the First Amendment. So uh, that's an, another sidelight into all that we'll, that we'll get into. Uh, and then we found out and why you want to stick around for the story was that there was an oral warrant issued in this case to seize the camera to see if there's pictures of the courtroom in there. Understand this. There is no such thing as an oral warrant. It's illegal. It has to be on paper. There was no paper. Because then it's a deputy, a sheriff, a policeman comes. We got we got a warrant here to serve on you, and that warrant lays out the parameters of what they can take, what they can search for, and whether they can take you or your body. And an or warrant, you can't read that and say, "Oh, okay, yeah, you get that. You get to look at this. You get to search my house for this or that or whatever." Or a warrant, you can't do that. It's illegal. Judge Knudsen issued one. All right, and then we're going to get into precinct resolutions relating to the judiciary. And I'll explain that whole process that we have uh, so that you can, um, you know, engage the precinct caucus and, uh, you know, have something to do while you're there. Have some good, fun discussion. Okay, uh, we're going to start out here then with uh, a hearing that took place. Oh, the DVD's working, right? That's working. Um, took place Tuesday night down at the legislature and in a committee. I forgot the committee now, but what was important, uh, uh, Representative Deal is the chair of this committee. I, th I think it's either the, it's not the education committee, but it might, might be the environmental committee. I'm not sure. Is uh, Lauren still there? What committee was that? Uh, and, and environment. Environment committee. Okay. Fascinating that this is in the environment committee and some of the questions that came up, unbelievable. But we're going to show you this clip of what's taking place because this bill that is before the, the House, uh, and Lauren, I'm sorry, give me the number of the bill. <laughs> <laughs> the bill number. It's House File 970-something. Anyway, it's about having safe schools so your children aren't on or near pollution. 957. It's 957, House File 957 in the Environmental Committee. 
and Representative Dill, the ch committee chair, had this bill heard, but there's no vote on it. It's preseason, you know, but when it comes up, they've done some background investigating on it, discussion. So when it comes up during the session, they can have a short discussion, pass it on or, or defeat it or not bring it up at all. But here's the Environmental Committee, which is there to protect the environment, to protect your kids, protect you from pollution. And a number of these legislatures could care less that you build a school on a dump site, let alone have toxins in it. Uh, unbelievable that that was going on. And this bill would make sure that you couldn't build a school on a dump site but more, than, more so than that, or within a quarter of a mile, but more so than that, that you as a parent would be notified if your school was and if there was pollution in the area and what kind of pollution was there. And the other big piece of this bill is that there's two levels of what, what you can build on. There's residential criteria for environmental pollution and there's industrial levels. Industrial levels are higher, about, uh, let's say just round number, 10% higher. Doesn't matter, it's just higher. That's all you need to know for this discussion. Well, schools where your kids spend 8 to 12 hours a day at, depending on the activities, and are rolling in the mud on these former dump sites, and uh, playing on the athletic fields and grinding their bodies into the ground. If you play football or soccer or any of these sports, you know, you're laying in this stuff. Uh, of course, it's all covered up, and supposedly everything goes down, nothing seeps up. Uh, that's not true. Uh, so here's all this uh, pollution, and it, it seems to be okay. But industrial levels higher, and the schools are at the industrial level for pollution, okay, where the residential is a lot lower. And this bill just says, hey, go make the schools have to comply with res residential levels. Understand this. All ground is polluted. Everything's polluted. You can't get rid of all of it. But what are safer and the safe levels that can be achieved? And let's put it at that level and have all schools at that level. This bill also does that. So then former representative Denise Dittrich gets up, he's representing the Minnesota School Board Association, which is like the League of Minnesota Cities. It's a kind of a, they get funded by the government indirectly because the school boards pay money uh, to this association and that association then helps uh, defend them. Same with the League of Minnesota Cities. It's kind of an insurance company for cities, but they represent cities. They don't represent the people uh, living in the cities. You know, they represent the, the city council and the, the city employees, but the citizens, no, they, they don't count. Well, same with the school board. They represent the school, Minnesota School Board Association, represents the school boards, not the students and not the parents. And let's hear what she has to say about this bill. I think you'll see some things uh, just to drive you nuts, drove me nuts. Let's hear what she has to say. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is, as mentioned before, Denise Dietrich. I am with the Minnesota School Boards Association. We represent every locally elected school board member across the state and have done so proudly since 1920. Uh, Representative Detmer and the School Boards Association share a common goal, and that is to ensure the health and safety of every school child in the state. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, and I speak to uh, some of the previous versions of this bill, uh, we got a new version of it about 3.30 today, and so have not totally vetted the new version, so I will be speaking to some of the old pieces that uh, were in the previous bill and try to revise some of my remarks to the new version that we <coughs> processed in the last uh, 45 minutes. But unfortunately, Representative Detmer and the School Boards Association disagree on one piece, and that is how and where uh, do you cite a new building for a new school? 
We feel at the Minnesota School Boards Association that it is the responsibility of locally elected school board members to determine when and where they need to locate new schools. These are major decisions and the process is very complex. It is not an easy job. As a school board, former school board member, I know firsthand of all the components that go into uh, and considerations that go into a site evaluation process. You need to look at the size of the property required. It needs to be centrally located for all of your students. It needs to have access to transportation, infrastructure. You would need to go through soil testing, and you need to consider cost to the taxpayers. When determining a potential site, the school board members need the flexibility and the authority to evaluate all potential sites. And after all, they are the ones who are held responsible or are liable if a mistake is made. Uh, this, the bill is previously written, restricted, and you reduced the flexibility and decision making of school board members when it comes to <coughs> assessing proposed uh, sites for schools. And so for that reason, we have, uh, we have uh, opposed previous versions of the bill. Uh, there are a couple of other reasons, more from it, the uh, scientific and research-based uh, reasons that we do not support the bill uh, as previously introduced. Uh, first of all is we believe that the, the current system works. We think that the right processes are in place and that it serves the Minnesota schools and residents very well. The MPCA's voluntary investigation and cleanup program serves our state very well. Thanks to forward-thinking people like Representative Jean Wigenius, we have a system that encourages landowners and potential landowners to clean up landfills and once again make them productive lands. This program encourages good stewardship and school districts should participate in the activity of good schools, of uh, uh, good stewardship. Uh, what we uh, have thought with previous uh, versions of the bill, what, what this will cause is school districts just to walk away from potential sites without even exploring them. And we believe that they at least should be able to be explored and worked with the NPCA to get certified safe, if it's possible. Uh, second of all is that we do not uh, support a one-size-fits-all for the whole state. Uh, currently, when a school district looks at a potential site, site they do initial soil testing, uh, once the testing is complete, if there was any potential or if there was any contamination on the site, the school district would go to the MPCA voluntarily to remediate to the point that the MPCA could give their approval. Or they would walk away from the property. And we think that that is, um, that is a, a good system. Uh, the sampling and testing and evaluation that the MPCA does is site-specific. And it could, should continue to be site-specific. Uh, this bill, as previously written, takes a statewide one-size-fits-all approach with the lack of consideration of the history of the previous site, uh, the makeup of the individual site, what was, what, was on, what was dumped in that site, and the potential for cleanup. The um, other instance that we had, a, the other part of the bill that we had an issue with, with is the uh, parent notification. This, the previous bill required the school to notify all the parents of the enrolled students and staff yearly if the school was sited within one quarter mile of a dump site or a closed, or, or a closed landfill. Uh, when the site was cleaned up, all the health and, health and safety recommendations were already, were already be, had been met and in some cases, like the Montanita School District, exceeded. Uh, there would be nothing to notify the parents of. And so the bill would, this part of the bill would not be needed. Uh, the uh, the uh, MPCA has put out um, a list of schools that are in with a quarter of a mile within a, a dump or a landfill. And there are over 275 schools that fall into that category. And uh, to my surprise, as a parent, I found two of those schools on that list were schools that my three children went to for their elementary and high school experience. That, uh, we had a very positive experience in our public school. And to be quite honest, if I was required to be notified every year that my, that my <coughs> two schools were, were within a quarter mile of a dump, that gives me a really tainted, uh, 
tainted idea or um, perception of the school that we we actually think very fondly of. And then ironically, then yeah. <clears throat> All right, who cares about the kids? You know, what, she, what I thought she was trying to say was, and she couldn't say it because it wasn't true, uh, these lands are clean. They meet the standards. And the issue is, no, they don't. They're, they're not meeting residential standards. And the, the ground is not as good as it needs to be for our kids. And we're not, I'm not, we're not talking about perfection here. We're talking about um, a reasonable standard. And <clears throat> what you're going to need to do is watch the All Around Grant show to get full history on this. And then, and then last night, Diana Longry had uh, on, uh, off the record at Lauren Cedarstrom, and they did a whole hour on this show. But my point here, she talked about MPCA, Minnesota Pollution uh, Agency, and guess what? MPCA is in favor of this bill. They, they think it needs to happen. They're in agreement. The major reason is there's a problem with how things are done now. And what's, what's the problem is, is that a school district, and in my opinion, like Mata Midi, um, can fudge the numbers, can play tricks, uh, and can uh, not do things the right way and they get, a, get away with it. You as a parent need to know, would you like to know that your kid, your children is going to a school that was once on a Superfund pollution site? A Superfund, meaning there was a problem, they had to dig it up, they had to clean it, or they didn't do it. It's just on that site. Twelve schools are currently on former Superfund sites. You know, don't you want to know? And let's say you just moved into the area and you didn't know that. Why, why wouldn't you know that? Well, you wouldn't. So that's what the importance of the notice is. Now, she said 275 schools are within this quarter mile range and people have to be notified. The real number is uh, 100, 100 schools. So she exaggerated there. And what's wrong with parental notification? There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, would it bias? Yeah, that's the intent, is to bias. Wouldn't you want to know? And I, I'm going to make this personal to Mata Midi, only this bill doesn't have to deal with Mata Midi. But there are so many parents that don't know the problems with the Mata Midi school and, and the pollution that's coming. The, now lead is starting to be found in a number of the lakes. The, the ball fields are starting to garbage is starting to come up out of the ground in the ball fields and oh there was so much testimony you know we we took out 500 and uh, say 73 yards or tons of dirt you know that's just not very much that's 50 truckloads that's nothing you know so um let's see um she said she didn't vet the this letter, well, they know what was going on, the, the new changes, they just got it, yes. Uh, but then she later on testified that, oh, somebody just gave me a letter a little while ago that agrees with us. Vet that letter, you know. Take the time to look at the bill. Um, so how and where new schools? You know what? you got to do soil testing. You have to do that. I, I th just there was a lot of crying, you know, it's, it, I got the feeling it was just say something to say it. You know, had no substance, didn't matter, let's just say it. So anyway, uh, if you want to watch this video um, of last night's show, go to youtube.com and then uh, All Around Grant, Grant, search for All Around Grant, and you can uh, watch this show. Um, about that bill is, is just very fascinating. I just had to bring it up because you need to know, parents, you need to find out this information so your kids are safe and aren't getting these toxins. Okay, uh, next area we're going to go into here. Okay, precinct caucuses, February 4th, get to them. That's where you have the most power, the most say. 
and resolutions are done for the particular party that you're in that will help define the platform and, and the beliefs of that party. Uh, and you get to know your, and meet your neighbors. And you have the most impact there. And so also your people that you want to have elected, you get to choose from. You get to choose and say, hey, I want you versus somebody else. We're going to give you our endorsement versus somebody else. That will give them a heads up or a leg up in the race uh, and, and will help the person that you want. Now, you may lose in that process, but you did something. You said something. And again, remember, if you don't have my ideology and have my uh, the things that I want to have see government do, I don't want you to show up to your precinct caucus. Don't go. Okay, because I want I that gives me a lot more power and a lot more say. So please don't go. Um, but in connection to that, uh, we're going to show a clip from a town hall uh, where Senator Wigger was at, and he was uh, <clears throat> and uh, Representative Lilly, Senator Ward, uh, or and uh, Representative Kent, or it's vice versa. Senator Kent, Representative Ward. Senator, Senator Kent and Ward. Senator Kent, Representative Ward, uh, were there, and you can ask them questions. But understand, there's no dialogue here. You know, they read. They you write down your question. They give an answer. This question was addressed to all of them to get an answer, but only Senator Wigger answered, and then they moved on. It's just too bad because you want to know where all your people stand. Uh, so let's watch this piece here, and um, I think you'll find it interesting. Um, the legislature is considering judicial retention elections with appointments versus election of judges by the people. Which way would you vote and why? You guys have more experience. I support the law as it is. And I, am, I believe that the public should have a direct uh, voice on the election. I know there's been a bipartisan group that has suggested uh, you know, that we change that. Uh, in effect, what happens now is most judges uh, will never face a, a real election the first time. They usually get appointed after there's a retirement right before the end of someone's term, and then they go through a committee of peers, which is good. But it, really doesn't go to the voters uh, for quite some time, but once you are incumbent or there, it's highly unlikely that you'd ever uh, be defeated. Uh, I am not convinced that we should change the law. I've talked to a number of judges in Ramsey County about this, and they agree as well. Uh, that doesn't mean that's the official position of the district court, but uh, I don't support a change. <laughs> okay, went on to another question after that. So this here, here's the distinction. I support the law as it is. And he says the public should have a direct voice and a direct vote in, in deciding who their judges are. However, as the law in the Constitution is currently written, the public is for 97 percent of the cases is their voice is out they don't have a direct voice there's no competition and so see how you can say i support the law as it is public should have a direct voice but guess what you don't get to have it now okay so i he just doesn't want to change anything uh, but if he wants the public to have a voice he needs to change things so that we have contested elections in Minnesota, meaningful contested election, meaning there's an opponent, there's transparency, there's debate, there's dialogue back and forth. It makes for a fascinating discussion. It makes for an enlightened uh, electorate. And um, another point he made was about the Ramsey County judges being in support of this. And yes, the Ramsey County judges are and the major reason, and I think that's the only reason that Senator Wigger supports it, because of the judiciary. Otherwise, I don't know that he would, because the local 
district court judges are in favor of we know the higher court is not in favor of elections. They don't like it. Uh, so he's siding with the district court judges, which is fine with me. But in Ramsey County, you know that you're in a district court judge, you're more than likely to be reelected because more than likely nobody's going to run against you. And you got the spot and you're in and you can do with it as you want. <laughs> so that's part of... Uh, um, um, that's part of the dialogue going there. But, he, you know, he's out asking the questions. Qu qu key question is, what do you want? That's what you need to find out. What do you want on this issue? And how do you want judges to, uh, do you want to have a say in your vote for judges? Do you want a form of accountability left? Uh, so that's what, I mean, I, I like his position. But things can't remain the same either. Otherwise, we got what he is against. <laughs> so, okay. Um, we're not going to do the, Michelle, we're running out of time already. I, the main thing I want to get together is to show you some uh, issues on precinct caucus resolutions and about the judiciary and reforming the judiciary. And this goes to my point that changes need to happen in our judiciary. Senator Wigger needs to know these changes. I'm going to read to you some of the Republican Party platform, and then I'm going to suggest to you, this could be the DFL Party platform. Sometimes the Republican Party and the DFL Party platform have the same ideas in there. And so I think this would go well with both of them. So I'm going to read you what the platform says, and then I'm going to add in certain pieces to it as we go along. The Republican Party platform says, We support contested, not retention, election of judges as provided by the Minnesota Constitution and oppose any proposals to eliminate or limit these elections. That means we want... Uh, we want a contest, you know. We want, uh, you know, people to have a choice. And as Senator Rigger said, yeah, there is a bipartisan group that is trying to take away your right to vote. But there's also a bipartisan group that's trying to keep your right to vote. Okay, and... Unfortunately, because of that bipartisan group that wants to keep your right to vote, uh, that side is winning so far, but it's not without uh, a battle that's taking place. Now, here's, I bring up graphic number nine. Here's a resolution that I want to add uh, to this section of the Republican Party platform, and you can copy this off and, and take it to your... Um, BPOU. Uh, we also support legislation that will limit the appointment of judges by the governor in order to increase contested elections. Okay, and this is significant because, you know, judges die, judges move away, judges retire, so there's a vacancy in the office. And in our Constitution, it says when there's a vacancy in the office, the governor can then appoint. Okay, or he cannot appoint. He can leave it open for an election, and he can do it by, and it can be done by statute, or the governor can do it by themselves. They don't have to appoint, but the option is there. We support legislation that will limit the appointment of judges by the governor in order to increase contested elections. This means that what we're ha having happen now, the judges know this game, so they retire at a certain point so then that the governor could appoint. And that's why you don't get to vote for judges. That's why you don't know who your judges are. You don't know their reputation, their character, where they came from, what their legal ideology is. Um, you're clueless. And believe me, there's a lot of judges who have bad character. And bad character is important. Uh, I should say this, you don't want to have a judge with bad character because they can really mess you over big time. And a lot of time, people just have to take it.
take the heat. Okay, so that's the first resolution there because with 97 of these percent of these judges being appointed without a contested election, um, we don't know what's going on in our judiciary. Okay, then the Republican Party also reads, judges should exercise their authority to review and when necessary limit excessive awards of damages and attorney's fees. A code of judicial ethics and enforced by a legislative board on judicial standards should be established by statute as a check on judicial power. Okay, so the first part, excessive damages, ex limit excessive awards and damages and attorney's fees. And there should be some limit on that. Um, and then the next piece is a new piece that was added prior that I and other people put an effort into, but a code on judicial ethics, which exists, that the judiciary put together, um, and, it, and enforced by a legislative board on judicial standards. This is different than the current board on judicial standards. Current Board on Judicial Standards is uh, appointed by the governor. It's a separate, it's not under anybody uh, in, in the uh, legislative scheme, in the government scheme of checks and balances. They're kind of separate out there. But here it's saying it should be under the legislature, and that's how our Constitution is written. Um, and it should be established by statute as a check on judicial power. And so that's something that's in the Republican Party platform that what you want to see go ahead and do. And there's been some bills introduced on that already. And then let's go to graphic 10. And this is the new piece that we want to add in here. This code of judicial ethics should limit gifts to judges to the same level as that of governor and the legislature. The governor and the legislature only gets and can get $5. You know, take them out for a meal, here's a gift, five bucks, you know, that's all you can do for them. What a judge can get is $150, and they don't have to report that. Okay, a huge, a huge distinction. Five dollars versus 150. Why is there a separate rules of judicial ethics than uh, legislative ethics? I can see how there can be some pieces of it. Now, one person will say, well, you know, a judge can't receive gifts from somebody that's going to be in front of them. Well, no, they can't, but somebody else can give them a gift that they know. And they, they, they do have rules against looking uh, impartial or, um, or giving the appearance of impropriety. They do have these rules against judges. But you don't have to report the 150 bucks, so how are you going to know? So just put it down to 50, and we'll go from there. All right, we've got a caller on the line. Uh, caller, do you have a comment or question? Uh, quick, quick comment. Um, yeah. I, like your, I like your code or whatever you're suggesting. But on that last one where it says the uh, judge should be limited to should be limited to what the governor and legislature should be should receive. I think it should be shall, meaning it must be the same limits as what the governor and the legislature receive. Because if you put in should, that's kind of a slippery slope where they can kind of get around it. But I just want to comment on that. But outside of that, I think you got a pretty good point. Yeah, uh, yeah, very, very, very good point. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and this is a uh, a, resol a resolution to the platform. So if it was going to be written into law, uh, that word shall would be there. Okay, so this is a general principle type thing. But you're right on, that's how it should be written, you know, with that word shall instead of should. Sure. Exactly. The other thing I was going to say, too, on uh, retention elections, I'm kind of having a little problem with that myself. I mean, okay. I'm kind of torn between two points. Um, on one hand, I agree with you on contested elections. You should know, you know, where your judges stand, their philosophy, their ideology, and so forth. But on the other hand, I, you know, I've kind of witnessed, well, I haven't witnessed it personally, but I've seen situations where judges receive money from special interests and they start targeting their points towards what the special interest wants. You know, say, I'll just throw this out, you have a debt collector that wants a judge that's going to rule in their favor. Well, that debt collector is going to 
fund that particular judge's campaign. And I, I want justice to be blind. I know I'm asking for something uh, maybe impossible, but I want it to be blind because I want it to be based on the case, but I want there to be integrity there. But, uh, you know, I appreci again, I just appreciate you bringing this out. Yeah, th thank you, caller. And, and that is, those are very important uh, issues. Uh, and there are safeguards you can put in uh, regarding campaign contributions to judges. And, and, of course, the biggest thing is disclosure. Um, because if somebody has given a lot of money to a judge, that judge can't rule on that case. Uh, so, th I mean, that's part of the code and a good part of the code on judicial ethics that, are, that is in there. But those are all issues that need to be worked out that right now are going on, but you don't know about it. And I think that's the big thing is that because of the lack of disclosure, because of the lack of what really is happening, we have no idea. And in my opinion, the, the judiciary, a number of people in the judiciary and the legislature and big corporate business want to establish this judicial oligarchy and put people in the office to be beholden to them. And you know, you give all this money to the governor and the governor appoints the judge and, you know, all these people know the connections, but you don't know the connections. And, and that's why there needs to be a significant level of reform going on that increases this transparency. Uh, very good points there. Okay, um, the next paragraph here is about the judiciary that is already in the Republican platform. Uh, we believe that in elections the word incumbent should be removed after judicial candidates name names on the ballot and that judicial vacancies should be appointed only until the next general election. Of course that helps out with the um, uh, contested to have contested elections but this word incumbent it's only found in two states, uh, two or three states that have the word incumbent behind uh, the judge's name. And the judges in Minnesota wants it because they say they've earned it. Well, most of these judges were appointed, and most of these judges don't run against anybody. So how do you word, win the word and earn the word incumbent when you did nothing for it? Um, that would be defined as being an incumbent. That, meaning that you went through a contested election. And it gives you a head up. It gives you the voters information that the judge then doesn't have to go out and provide and doesn't have to be in the community and the community doesn't have to know who they are. So uh, we'd like to see that in there. And there's been a bill proposed and had hearings on relating to that, but that's also new to the platform, thanks to the work of myself and other people. Also, those voting in judicial elections must be required to be residents in the county in which the judge will preside and that the voters should have the ability to remove any judge from office regardless of whether someone chooses to run against them. Now, this is interesting because if, if you knew what that was saying, that was saying that's a retention election right there. But let's say we do have these contested elections, but right now we're sitting with a lot of elections that aren't contested. You don't know who the judge is, and nobody's going to run against them. There's another code of judicial conduct that's unwritten that says, don't you dare run against the sitting judge, or we're going to punish you. And former Judge Tom Armstrong out of Washington County laid that out uh, when he was being gone after for... Um, some of perceived shenanigans that took place when he resigned from judgeship. But that's in his response uh, about how he was treated because he ran against a sitting judge and he got treated pretty bad. Uh, but all the judges and the attorneys know this. This is no secret. <laughs> you know, everybody else it's a secret, but not to them. I'm the one, one of the persons getting that message out that that's part of the game that gets, uh, gets played. So if a judge, nobody is running against a judge, that judge should then have an up or down vote. Do you want him or do you not want him? Uh, or him or her as a judge. 
So it is a retention type of election, but that's when nobody runs against them and somebody could. Okay, so we're, again, going to make that judge work, going to make him get out. Who is this person? What are they about? Going to let people know who this individual is and what they're doing. Uh, just make this judiciary alive, you know, and responsive to the people in the Constitution that they swore an oath to. Um, okay. The voters must have access to essential information about those judges on the ballot through a transparent public evaluation process. So people get to know the judge's decision, what they're writing, what they're saying. They can have a place to get community input about the judiciary and that particular judge. You ever notice that in a paper, when there's a trial going on, sometimes the judge is, is named, sometimes they aren't. And I think, that's, I think that is specifically dealing with whether a judge wants their name to be named or not, if they see it as an advantage that their name is named. But why in the world would a reporter ever not say the name of the judge when they're talking about a court case and who, the, who it's before? Why would they not do that? But they don't. It, it's just amazing. So the press has uh, uh, an issue here with what's going on. Um, okay, the judiciary must openly and transparently have all administrative documents available to the public. You, you know that the judiciary isn't subject to data practices. The administrative part, the budget part, um, uh, various aspects of how the judiciary is run, you, you can't find out, you know, uh, can't do that. They won't let you. They just say, well, you, we're not subject to it, too bad. You don't get the information. Okay, then another resolution coming up here. It's in three parts here, so we'll be going back and forth uh, when we talk about them. But uh, go to number 11. Um, also, we support, and this is a new resolution that I want you to take to your precinct caucuses, we support that all court cases at all levels of the state court are filmed for both audio and video and these recordings are accessible to the public within a reasonable amount of time. Okay, that's the first piece there, so we can come back here. Um, you know this isn't done. The Supreme Court is always filmed, and within a day or so, uh, you can go and look, go to the website and watch the Supreme Court case and find out what's going on there should be done. I applaud them. They're better than the United States Supreme Court that doesn't allow the video being taken. The appellate court can be filmed. So I can go down there and film the appellate court. Uh, but they don't automatically do that. They should automatically do that, uh, like they do with the Supreme Court. Uh, and then district court, the way it works at district court is, as a press person, I have to make a request, and all three parties have to agree. Then you're in. If one of the party disagrees, then a judge can overrule that party. So the bottom line, it's up to the judge. You know, and you got to notify them ten days prior to the hearing, uh, so accommodations could be made. I guarantee you, the accommodations take less than a day. Uh, and the basic re reason for that is there needs to be a pull feed and somebody's got to provide a feed so that everybody else can record off that feed uh, that the one person in the courtroom. They're, they're, you know, there just shouldn't be 50 cameras in the courtroom. I understand that um, aspect and reality to it. But just to deny the film press into that courtroom and relying only on the reporters' words of how they, what they heard and saw in that courtroom, it's, I just don't think is as reliable as actual video from that courtroom. And boy, we missed the doozy here, and we're not going to get get to it. But that's the number one. Freedom of the press is a First Amendment right. All levels of the Minnesota court should have it. 
Okay, number two. Uh, let's go back to the graphic. A judge or justice must sign all rulings, orders, and opinions that they participate in and vote on. And I got a lot of feedback from that. What do you, what do you mean? Judges don't sign all orders and um, don't, uh, that they participate in and all their rulings, they don't do that? And the answer is no. Uh, if you were to look up any Supreme Court case in Minnesota, you don't know every single judge and how they voted on that case. You know the judge who made the, the majority ruling. You know the judge that made the dissent. And those that have concurred in part or disagreed in part, you know anybody that was against the, the majority decision maker and who wrote that. But you don't know where, who the rest of the judges are. So if you want to go 10 years in the past and find out, you may find uh, in Minnesota three, three of the seven justices' names on that, but who were the other four? You don't know. That's not right. You shouldn't have to go and do research and go, okay, who are the justices on that particular date when that order came out who signed that order? And you need that for transparency, for accountability. You know, it could be two years ago, and you don't know which justices it was. You, I mean, you'd have to constantly keep, keep up. If they voted on it, their name should be on it, just like the legislature. And that's not happening in, in our Minnesota Supreme Court or our appellate courts. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, a judge's name is on all uh, district court rulings or orders. But sometimes they just sign it. You can't read what they sign. You don't know who that is. And then they don't even put the name underneath the signature. You know, <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, but see, see this problem in our judiciary, this, these little, little ticky-tacky things that they just don't have right that they will hold you accountable for? Okay, number three. Let's go to the last one. Transcripts become available for, not for, from, I need to change, uh, from the appellate courts. Uh, that should be changed. You can't get an appellate court transcript of the hearing and what took place. Uh, before you couldn't videotape, now you can videotape, but all they rely is in the order. But you want to hear what these conversations, you want to hear what these justices, judges asked in the dialogue that went back and forth and the transcript would have that. You can't get that from the appellate court because some of the things they say there is unbelievable and you'd want to know that. Because they make these justice judges make statement claims. Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. Um, so that's pretty much it on the judiciary that's already in the Republican platform. Uh, uh, oh, actually, there's one more sense. But here's another resolution. We're running out of time. We support the creation of legal assistance centers to help thousands of people who can't afford an attorney and attempt to represent themselves in court cases. The difference here is we have self-help centers. Self-help centers are not legal assistance centers because they can't help you legally. They can just tell you what forms you need for what you're telling them you want to do. And that's how they help you out, but they can't give you any legal advice. This is about legal assistance centers. It's messing up our judiciary. It's taking a lot of time, wasting a lot of time. Judges get angry. They can become retaliate, retaliatory, and then people just really get messed up in this deal because they just don't have some basic, simple help uh, that they should be able to get. Uh, also on the platform, our legislators are our lawmakers. Judges are not to make or write law. They are, when they act to do so, they need to be corrected by the legislative branch as provided by the Minnesota Constitution. And, you know, that again, a lot of that has my handprints on getting in there. Uh, so it's a good platform. I think these changes to the Republican platform or the Democratic platform will help. Uh, transparency for the judiciary. Okay, um, real quickly, the McDonald case. Uh, a judge uh, 
Attorney McDonald was arrested for contempt of court. This is a citation. This is not an arrest. There's no reason to arrest. They wanted to give her a, a citation. They arrested her for it. You didn't need to do that. There's three reasons to arrest a person for a citation. If that's if they're a danger to themselves. If they're not going to show up to the court case, she's an attorney. Come on. Uh, and then um, uh, themselves or others, there's one other reason, didn't apply in this case. They still arrested her. Unbelievable that they did this. Um, so, uh, and Judge Knudsen was part of this um, oral warrant, which is totally unconstitutional. They wanted Judge Knudsen to testify. The testimony was squashed by the judge. The attorney general came in and argued on behalf of Judge Knudsen. And the, the answer to this, or uh, Attorney McDonald's attorney said, this is unusual. There are cases judges do have to testify because of judges' behavior outside the capacity of their responsibility. And when a judge issues an oral warrant, they went outside their jurisdiction. They don't get any immunity. If he would have issued a paper warrant, no big deal. They would have seen it. They would have known. They could have been contested. It wasn't done. They have immunity except oral arguments. And, uh, um, and so... You know, one of the things the Attorney General is saying, hey, this is a work product, you can't get work product. Well, oh, I, I guess the music's going, I don't hear it in here, uh, but we're about out of time. So, folks, remember, if you don't uh, stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? God bless, have a great week, good men don't do nothing. Days go by like the forest sets on fire And the wind takes the kite as the firefly brings the light